KMS talk on log minimal models for moduli space and point invariance. Okay, thanks very much. So I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, let's see. So, right, so I guess my starting point is the starting point of, of many talks that we've seen today. Uh, but don't fall asleep. It will have a different flavor, I promise. Um, so, right, so we have this Hassett Keel program where mg bar of alpha is uh, proj of the graded ring of pluricanonical sections. Uh, well, log canonical sections where alpha is a rational number. And so let me just say what I sort of uh, see to be the kind of interesting questions around this. So first of all, I mean, as Professor Reed pointed out, I mean, in some sense, the really hard fact is already known, which is just the fact that these rings are finitely generated. So in fact, we know more. So BCHM implies that there exists a finite sequence of rational numbers Okay, such that so these models stay constant within the open intervals and then they undergo some kind of contraction or flip at each threshold value. So, so sorry. So mg bar of alpha undergoes a flip or a contraction at these threshold values. Okay, so this is what BCHM gives us. And so for me, an interesting question then is, so can we actually find all these rational numbers? So what are the rational numbers alpha i? And, uh, and then the second question is, can we describe these birational transformations explicitly? So we have some kind of birational transformation happening at these threshold values, and we'd like to describe them explicitly. <laughs> Let's see, what did I, ah, uh, yeah, OK. Thank you. Look, I'm tired just like the rest of you, all right. <laughs> um, OK, there we go, thank you. Um, right, so I mean, we've already seen, so uh, in Dong Hoon's uh, talk, we saw, uh, okay, I mean, we know that alpha 1, again, by this work of Hassett and, and Hyun, uh, alpha 1 is 9 11, so alpha 2 is 7 tenths. And basically, by looking at a particular subvariety, the hyperelliptic locus, he gave us a sort of a sequence of, of critical values at which we expected those AK singularities to appear. Um, and in some sense, I'll do something similar to that at the end of this talk. What would really be interesting, and, and he also said that basically these AI values, from his perspective, come from GIT somehow. It's, it's, it's encoded in these, in these linearizations and the, the ample line bundles that they descend to. Um, so from my perspective, I mean, one question that I want to throw out there is, do these alpha i's have any intrinsic connection to the geometry of curves? Okay, in other words, is there something about curves or curve singularities that would dictate those numbers alpha i. And I'll say something about that. I'll answer that question to some extent uh, by the end of this talk. So let me just say that for mg bar, the strategy or the main tool is clearly so far as we've seen git. So for mg bar, the strategy is evidently git. So what I'm going to do in this talk is something a little different. So in this talk, um, I'll basically answer these questions completely in the special case of M1 n bar. So in this special case, I'll give you a complete answer to these questions that I just posed um, without GIT. So it's kind of a, a miracle that this, this works out. Um, and I think where I need to start is by explaining, OK, well, you know, why on earth would I consider the case M1 n bar? OK, so I mean, when I started thinking about this problem, we have this space of pseudo-stable curves that's been uh, mentioned several times, this space with cusps. And so you naturally think, OK, what are the next most complicated singularities after cusps? So the question comes up, so what are you know, the simplest curve singularities? We should just try to make moduli spaces of those. And 
And so in the, the talk that I gave yesterday, I just said, OK, well, we have these very basic curve, these invariants. If I have a singular point p on a curve, and I look at the normalization, then we have the number of branches, which is just you know, the number of points lying above p in the normalization. And then I also define the genus of the singularity to be the delta invariant minus m plus 1. And if you remember our discussion yesterday, I sort of defined these things. I said delta is basically the number of conditions for a function to descend from the normalization to the curve. And then if you have a curve with m branches, there are m minus 1 obviously necessary conditions because the function has to have the same value at each of the m points. That's m minus 1 conditions. So this is delta minus m minus 1. So this is just the number of conditions beyond the obvious ones. And we can actually classify all curve singularities in low genus. So let me just uh, draw that picture, because I think it's sort of illuminating. And again, I drew this yesterday. So if you ask, OK, so what is a genus 0 singularity with one branch? Well, that's just actually a smooth branch, if you think about it. And then for m equals 2, you have a node. And then for m equals 3, you have three branches in uh, A3. So three completely transverse branches. And then this pattern just continues. So for M4, you have four branches in A4, and so on. OK, so that's, that's the situation for genus 0. There's just a single uh, analytic isomorphism class of singularity for each value of G and M. OK, now let's look at the situation for G equals 1. So for g equals 1 with one branch, we saw yesterday we had the cusp. OK, so that's just y squared equals x cubed. And then for m equals 2, we have the tack node. So y squared equals x to the fourth. And then for m equals 3, we have the, so now this is the planar triple point. So not three transverse coordinate axes in A3, but rather just three lines in A2. OK, and now as above, there's a pattern that continues here. Uh, you don't see it so much in the beginning. But now if I consider four lines in A3, so this is four lines in A3, and then five lines in A4, and so on, then it turns out that those singularities all have genus 1. So again, there's this, there's this infinite sequence, OK? So again, three. Projective frame of reference. What's that? You want to do a projective frame of reference. Uh, yes, that's sure. Um, so these are genus 1 singularities. But now, there is another kind. Say what? There is another kind. I mean, you know, you're, you're drawing the garden side. Ah, OK. <laughs> Way to spill my punchline, man. But OK, yeah. Right, so, that, so the point is that for genus 1 singularities, uh, G and M do not uniquely determine it, right? So as we said yesterday, I could take a cusp, and then I could just pass a branch transverse to that cusp in the plane. And that would also. Uh, be a genus 1 singularity with two branches. So I have two here. And it turns out that those are the only two. OK, and similarly, I actually have three genus 1 singularities. Um, so I could take a cusp and then pass two completely transverse branches through. Or I could take a tack node and pass one transverse branch through. OK, so there are three genus 1 singularities with three branches. All right, so I have, I mean, look, there are tons of singularities here already. I mean, yesterday I was writing down these wild compactifications in which all of these occur. But it turns out that the really nice thing to look at is just this sequence here. So, and the reason for this, as Professor Reed already uh, indicated, is that these are exactly the Gorenstein singularities. Okay, so of course a smooth curve is Gorenstein and a node is Gorenstein. But it turns out that all of these singularities are not Gorenstein, and all of these singularities here are not Gorenstein. So what a Gorenstein singularity is, it just means that the dualizing sheaf is locally free. Now that's actually a very important condition in moduli theory, because when you, when you describe a moduli functor, one of the first things you need, if you're going to sort of construct it in this modern way, you, and you want to find an atlas, um, if you have a canonical polarization, then that's what lets you use the Hilbert scheme to find an atlas. So when you want to make a sort of moduli space of singular objects, this Gorenstein condition is very important. And of course, there are a lot of subtleties around this that come up in the case of surfaces. Now here I need to make one kind of disclaimer at, with point of reference to my talk yesterday. I mean, yesterday I didn't worry about Gorenstein at all, and I made moduli spaces with all of these things. Now the point is that in the special case of curves, 
you actually don't really need the Gorenstein condition. And somehow I, I shoved all that under the rug yesterday um, by, say, by just starting out saying, you know, we have this fact that the stack of all curves is actually an algebraic stack. That fact fails for surfaces precisely because of these issues. Um, now this is, there are subtleties here that I don't really want to get into. So let me just say that in the special case of curves, you actually don't need Gorenstein curves to make a moduli functor. But somehow, if you want to follow what we now think of as the kind of very classical recipe of Deline and Mumford, it's better to start with, with Gorenstein ones. So that's what I originally did when I looked at this problem. I thought, okay, surely this, this here is the sequence of singularities that we want to look at. Okay? So let me call these the elliptic m-fold points. Okay, so I'm thinking of a cusp as an elliptic one-fold point, a tack node as an elliptic two-fold point, planar triple point as an elliptic three-fold point, and so on. Okay. Um, right, so now what we should do is we should try to make moduli spaces uh, with these singularities. So the first question we have to ask is, okay, if we want to put these singularities into our moduli functor, in order to keep a separated functor, what do we have to take out? So again, yesterday I said... There's this very basic fact that if you take a cuspidal curve and you look at a smoothing of that curve, then, uh, and then you look at the limit of the smooth family inside mg bar, what you get is the normalization plus an elliptic tail uh, attached at the point lying above the cusp. And I told you that as you vary over all smoothings of this cuspidal curve, you see all possible J invariants of this uh, elliptic tail here. So you see, in other words, every point of M11 bar is represented as a sort of stable tail of a stable reduction of this thing. So that was why we have to remove all possible uh, elliptic tails when we want to keep in cusps. So the first thing we have to do now is sort of, okay, so we have to look at these other singularities and say, what happens there? And I mean, it turns out that we're in very good shape. I mean, for any of these elliptic m-fold points, now this is not easy. This is a, you know, a, a lemma on the way to the theorem. If you look at any of these elliptic m-fold points, okay, and you look at a smoothing, and then you look at the limit of that smoothing in mg bar, I mean, just for genus reasons, you can see that what you're going to get is an elliptic you know, somehow a, a multi-elliptic bridge, if you want. Uh, what you will see is just an elliptic curve attached at the points uh, above the, you know, the points on the normalization there. And, and the first key fact you need is that, again, there are no conditions on this curve. So, in fact, every point, all points of M1 N bar, all points of M1 N bar do arise as um, stable tails associated to a suitable smoothing of an elliptic m-fold point. Okay? So does my statement make sense? Uh, so what I'm saying is that, just like here, as we range over all possible smoothings of an elliptic m-fold point, the stable tails that you see range over all possible j invariants and all possible configurations of those m-points. So we really do have to get rid of all possible um, elliptic M bridges if we want to put in an elliptic M fold point. I mean, this might be belaboring what seems to be a kind of obvious point, but this is, you know, we have these subtleties, right? That, you know, in um, Dong Hoon's talk, we were seeing that, you know, well, maybe you only have to replace uh, genus two tails with a ram, you know, attached to a Weierstrass point. There are subtleties that come up. Here I'm just saying, no, the correct thing is just to take out all these elliptic bridges. Okay, so now, all right, let's uh, proceed ahead. So now we should define a stability condition. So we should say, okay, let's just say that C is M-stable if the following three conditions hold. Okay, so let's just say C has nodes, cusps, dot, 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 up to elliptic M-fold points. Okay, and uh, all right, so if we're going to put in all these singularities, then we know we have to take out all elliptic tails, elliptic two bridges, elliptic three bridges, and so on. The easiest way to say that is that if E and C is an arithmetic genus one subcurve, then the degree 
of omega c restricted to e. So basically, the degree of omega c restricted to e is just going to be the number of attaching points uh, counted with some kind of suitable multiplicity. And so I'm just going to say that the degree of omega c restricted to e should be greater than m. OK. So in, so in these bridges, you can't have multiple lines through the same point. Uh, say what? You could have a picture up there where two of those little hairs were actually through the same point. Right, right. So that, of course, that's the tricky issue with these stability conditions is exactly what precisely the condition is. No, it gets very subtle. Um, so that condition is M-connected. M-connected. It's, it's, it's the degree of, it's the intersection degree of C. And yeah, C okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, it's the same thing as just saying no elliptic amber, just right. Um, uh, yeah, but it's only for the arithmetic genus 1 subgroups. That's the key thing, right. Um, OK, and then the last thing, of course, since I wanted to lean Mumford stack, I should say, OK, well, I want my automorphism group to be finite. This is naively what you would write down. OK, but this doesn't work. So, and the reason it doesn't work is, I mean, I think I drew the picture yesterday. Um, so suppose we consider a family of genus 3 curves approaching a ring of two elliptic bridges, like this. OK, and we ask ourselves, all right, well, what would sort of the limit be in a hypothetical tack nodal space? OK, in a space where we want to replace elliptic bridges by tack nodes. Well, I mean, you're fine. If you pick an elliptic bridge, you can replace it. And you get some tack nodal limit, which certainly actually does satisfy these conditions. Or you could pick, the problem is that you have a choice here, because you could also pick the other elliptic bridge. So the functor isn't separated. Now, there is kind of a more canonical thing to do here, which is to blow up both these points and therefore insert P1s. And now you have these elliptic bridges here. And then you could contract both of those elliptic bridges. And then you have a curve that looks like that. And I think we can all agree that that looks pretty canonical. But now we've got a curve with automorphisms. OK, so the problem is that when you run into, when you try to make these sort of moduli spaces with singularities, as soon as you go past cusps, even when you try to go to tack nodes, you cannot get a separated moduli functor without um, allowing curves with automorphisms. Okay, And this was, in some sense, the upshot of my talk uh, yesterday. So what I'm going to do now is kind of go in a different direction with this and make the following very uh, naive, almost trivial observation, which is that suppose I consider an n-pointed curve, a stable n-pointed curve of arithmetic genus 1. What does that look like? Well, basically, all stable you know, curves of arithmetic genus 1 with, with points they basically look like some arithmetic genus 1 curve with a bunch of trees of P1s coming off of them. Now, there can also be rings of P1s. Um, but in either case, you cannot have this phenomenon of two elliptic bridges somehow interacting in this way. So just making that stupid observation, you might ask, or anyway, I asked, um, well, can I somehow make this whole procedure work just by restricting myself to the case of M1N bar and trying to come up with alternate compactifications of M1N bar. And in that particular case, in fact, it turns out that this whole idea does go through. And everything we want will be just a Deline Mumford stack that we can uh, construct using those techniques without any GIT involved. Okay? So there will be no curves with infinite automorphism groups necessary. OK, so if I take an n-pointed curve, so whenever I say an n-pointed curve here, I mean, OK, so there's a curve with n points. They're smooth and distinct. So smooth, distinct. And so let's, from now on, I'm only going to be considering curves of arithmetic genus 1. So let's take an n-pointed curve of arithmetic genus 1. OK, then what do I need to do to modify this definition? So not much. So now I'll just say that my pointed curve is m stable, OK, if, just as before, I'll allow c to have nodes up through elliptic m-fold points. I'll also keep this automorphism condition the same. The only thing that I have to change here 
is that on arithmetic genus 1 subcurves, instead of requiring that the dualizing sheaf have degree greater than m, I'm going to change. This is something you always do when you're looking at moduli spaces of pointed curves. I'm going to ask that the dualizing sheaf twisted by the marked points restricted to any arithmetic genus subcurve have degree greater than m. OK? So this is going to be my uh, condition. And I'm going to spend you know, uh, 10 minutes here kind of spelling out exactly what it means. But just take that as the definition for the moment. And then the theorem is that, um, so then the theorem is that this works. So, uh, so if you fix integers, so for kind of naive reasons, uh, which would be clear if you think about it. So you fix integers m less than n, then this moduli space, m1 n bar, so this is by de I'm defining this to be the moduli stack of m stable curves is a proper Deline Mumford stack. And I mean, we can just work over C for now. For those who care about these things, this whole construction works uh, except in characteristics two and three, where the deformation theory of cusps is uh, bad. But other than that, we're fine. So basically, all I'm saying here is you have, a moduli, you have a moduli space for curves like this. Everything is fine at automorphisms. You're fine. And you really do have a unique limit property. So that's the key here. So uh, is that brackets of M or brackets of alpha? So brackets of M. Oh, yes. Oh, right. So this is going to be, uh, this is going to start getting in trouble with our notation because we have, later we're going to want to look at sort of MG of alpha or M1N of alpha. So uh, maybe I should call this M1N superscript M. So M1N M, that's the moduli space of M stable curves. Um, so N pointed M stable curves of genus one. Okay. And so the key thing behind this theorem is to see that you do have a unique limit property. Now we've already seen intuitively what we want to do. Intuitively, we just want to take the Deline Mumford stable limit and then just start replacing these elliptic bridges by these elliptic singularities. So there's just one kind of wrinkle to that idea that we have to understand to make this work. So suppose that I have a family of genus one curves. So this is uh, with three marked points. If I take a one parameter family, say, approaching something like this, where this is genus 0 and this is genus 1. OK, now let me ask, what's the tack nodal limit? So what's going on with this example? The point that I want to make is that this is actually not in our, this is not too stable by the definition that I'm giving here, because the degree of the dualizing sheaf twisted by the marked points is only 2 when I restrict to this elliptic subcurve. OK? So somehow in this definition, because I'm throwing in the marked points, this is somehow counting as an elliptic bridge. So what am I going to do to get a tack nodal curve out of this? So the key is that you first blow up the total space of this family at this marked point. So what does that do? That introduces a new genus 0 curve. And of course, the marked point now lies there, because it's just the strict transform of a section that was going through there. And then you can contract this elliptic bridge. And so you get a curve that looks like this, where I now have two genus 0 curves meeting at a tack node. One of them has two marked points. One of them is one marked point. OK. So we get this curve. And now the key point is that's actually a good limit, because this curve, in contrast to the case of nodal curves, which is what you're probably all used to thinking about, this curve actually still has finite automorphism group. In fact, no automorphisms. So the point is that when you're on a tack nodal curve, it's not true that any automorphism of the normalization automatically descends to an automorphism of the curve. It has to act compatibly on the tangent spaces. So if I take the trivial automorphism on one component here and have an automorphism that's scaling the tangent space on the other component, that's not going to descend. So this is still a curve with finite automorphisms. So this is the two stable limit of this family. Okay. So, okay, so now that we, and by the way, so why is it that kind of, remember yesterday I said that you can never have a stable modular compactification with nodes, cusps, and tack nodes. That was kind of the upshot of the discussion. Here I'm telling you, you do get something with nodes, cusps, and tack nodes. But the point is that what inevitably crops up 
is these P1s with just two distinguished points. Okay? So, uh, right, so let me just take one more minute to kind of spell out. I mean, now you might be wondering, okay, this is all kind of confusing. I don't know. You know, when I was in the world of nodal curves, I know what it means for a curve to have finite automorphisms. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not so sure anymore, so let me just state exactly what's going on there. So, lemma. So, if C is a curve of arithmetic genus 1, so if C has arithmetic genus 1, and P in C is an elliptic m-fold point, let me just sort of spell out in detail what it means to be m-stable in this definition. OK, then, all right, so the idea is we have some curve. It's got one of these funky elliptic m-fold points. So then what has to be true just for genus reasons is that the normalization of C at P uh, is m distinct trees of P1s. Okay, so the only way that you can get an arithmetic genus 1 curve with one of these elliptic m-fold points is just like we're seeing here. Each of the branches has to be a distinct tree of P1s. So I mean, it could be a tree. It doesn't have to be irreducible. It could look something like this. But you get the idea. And there will be marked points on here. Okay. And then the question is, what does it mean to, for this curve to be m-stable? So the point is, uh, the automorphism group of C is finite if, and the condition will look just like this one here, um, I'm going to want each of the branches to have at least two distinguished points, just like this one has two distinguished points, and at least one of the branches has to have three distinguished points. Okay? So the point here is that if both of these branches, if I had a curve where somehow both of these branches only had one other distinguished point besides their meeting at the tack node, then this curve actually would have a C star of automorphisms because you could take automorphisms on the P1 that are scaling the tangent spaces identically. So this is precisely what we disallow. We, we're going to allow semi-stable components, but no more than m minus 1 of them meeting at an elliptic m-fold point. Okay? So the automorphism group of C is less than infinity uh, if and only if, um, let's see, two conditions, all m branches meeting at P have at least two distinguished points. And at least one has, at least one of the branches meeting P has at least three distinguished points. OK? So why can't why, why can we do something along these lines with your stability condition yesterday? Um, why couldn't I do something along these lines with my stability condition yesterday? I mean, the point is that. Uh, to, get, to get a compact moduli space here, right, I really have to allow these semi-stable P1s. And in that whole... Change the definition of stable along these lines. Oh, well, then I can't prove the theorem, right. So, that, I mean, I didn't talk about the proof of the theorem, right? The proof of the theorem uses a sort of very silly trick, which I never talked about, which is that basically... In, in some sense, I don't want to go into it, but the point is that you sort of you dominate everything by a stable curve. The point is that since we have to do these blow-ups in order to get the m-stable limits, the stable limit no longer maps down to the m-stable limit. They're only related by rationally. That makes it much harder to, to keep track of. Um, but right, I mean, what you're saying is, look, we should just try to classify all, you know, all modular compactifications, not just the stable modular compactifications. And I agree that that's a perfectly good goal. Um, it's just that, yeah, we don't have a theorem in that regard. I'm just going to talk about this particular sequence. Okay, so the point is, once you have this, this lemma here, then it's very easy to say, I mean, what the algorithm is for actually producing the m-stable limit. We already saw it. It's basically you just alternate between um, blowing down these bridges and sort of when you, whenever you see some marked points, you blow up those marked points first. So let me just do one more example. And then I think you guys will believe it, that there really is a sort of canonically defined limit process here in contrast to that case in genus 3 where we sort of clearly saw there was no way to produce a unique tack nodal limit. So let me just do one more example. 
So if I take a family of genus 1 curves specializing to something like this, okay, where this is now my elliptic curve and these all have genus 0, so this is a family of five pointed uh, elliptic curves. Okay, so this, as what, I, what I've drawn here, is the Deline Mumford stable limit. This is also the one stable limit because there are no elliptic tails here. So this is DM stable. It's also one stable because what we do to get the one stable limit, in other words, to take the limit inside of M1N of 1, to get the one stable limit, we just have to replace elliptic tails by. Um, cusps, but we have no elliptic tails here, so that's fine. Now suppose I want to take the two stable limit. Well, I see an elliptic bridge here. Okay, so I contract it. Okay, so there's my two stable limit, no problem. And now I say, well, is that three stable? Yes, it's still three stable because there's no... So if I look at now the sort of minimal arithmetic genus 1 subcurve inside this curve is this whole thing. And the degree of the dualizing sheaf on that, or the, rather the dualizing sheaf twisted by the marked points, is going to be 1 for this meeting point, 2, 3, 4 for the marked points. So the degree of omega c twisted by marked points is 4 on this thing. So this is still 3 stable. But then when I try to take the 4 stable limit, okay, now I have to get rid of this thing. And so what I do is I just blow up all the marked points and then... So I blow up all the marked points, so that gives me a picture like this. Right, where these are now all P1s that I've inserted into my special fiber. And then I can actually contract this whole thing to an elliptic fourfold point. So this is actually the four stable limit of this family, where this is now an elliptic fourfold point. And again, this still satisfies the automorphism condition that I need by that lemma that I wrote down. Okay? And this is as high as it goes. You're only allowed to, to we're only constructing these spaces for m up to n minus 1. Okay? So I'm fixing m less than n. All right, so I'm just trying to convince you here that there is a kind of canonical replacement procedure. And I think you can kind of see it from, from that example. You just keep going, and whenever you see marked points, you blow them up. And the point is, when you make your contractions, you always have at least one component which is sort of still has three distinguished points and that kills the automorphisms. Okay, by the way, proving uniqueness of limits in this situation is really, really hard. So I did it in this very kind of ad hoc way, um, which takes many, many pages. I've often felt that this should all be sort of encoded with respect to some kind of, you know, when you take the stable limit, you're basically running MMP with respect to the relative dualizing sheaf. I've often felt this should be MMP with respect to some different kind of line bundle. Uh, but I've never been able to find what that line bundle is. So <laughs> I just throw that out there. Um, okay, so we have these spaces. Now, how are they kind of related to each other birationally? So let me just draw a picture to explain the sequence of birational transformations uh, connecting these spaces. It's very explicit and it's very, um, it's very pretty. So I'll draw the picture for um, M14 bar. So, right, so here what I want to do is I just want to explain how are these spaces related. And, I mean, this is just pictures. I'll sum up all these pictures in a theorem at the end. Um, right, so when I want to go from M1 4 bar to M1 4 bar 1, well, we've already basically seen what happens here. I'm looking at the locus of curves with elliptic tails. So here I'm looking at the locus of curves which break into an elliptic tail there and a genus zero component with four marked points, right? That's the locus of elliptic tails in here. And I just replace that elliptic tail by a cusp. So that's the first birational transformation. And I mean, since you're forgetting the data of the J invariant, it's easy to see that you're contracting this to a co-dimension two locus. Okay, so now let's go from M14 bar of 1 to M14 bar of 2. So now there are kind of two steps we have to think about because there are two different kinds of elliptic bridges. So on the one hand, I have elliptic bridges that look like this, again forming a divisor. So if I have a genus 1 component here and a genus 0 component here with one marked point on the genus 1 component, that's an elliptic bridge, as I sort of have been using the word. 
On the other hand, of course, I also have these sort of a co-dimension two locus of elliptic bridges, like this, where I have this elliptic curve with the two other genus zero components. So let me pull apart kind of, and it is possible to do this. In fact, these loci are disjoint, so you can kind of deal with them separately when you're trying to um, explicitly factorize the map from M14 of one to M14 of two. I see, okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I guess I'm, I'm reverting back to this notation just because that's what I'm used to, sorry. So M1 N superscript M is going to be the same as M1 N of M in this talk, sorry. Um, okay, so when we want to get rid of this, of course, we just replace this by TAC nodes. As we've seen, the TAC nodal curves that you get is obtained by sort of sprouting off a P1 there and then contracting the elliptic bridge. So here... You replace by tac nodal curves that look like this. So let me call this M14 of one and a half because I'm just dealing with. I'm just dealing. Uh oh. Okay, because I'm just dealing with these elliptic bridges, but now I need to deal with these elliptic bridges. So these are still here. Okay, and the point is that now we actually have, instead of a contraction, a flip. So we flip these to the locus of tac nodal curves that looks like this. To get inside of M1, 4 of 2. Right, so now something really funny is going on. Why are we getting a flip here? Okay, so the idea is that these are basically parameterized by M1, 2 because I just need to pick the bridge. Since these are just three-pointed P1s, there's no choice of moduli there. What's going on is that you can think of this as being factorized by a simple blow-up along this locus. And the exceptional divisor of that blow-up is then going to be M1 2-bar times P1. I'm inside a four-fold here. So I'm inside M1 2-bar times P1. And then I'm contracting down in the other direction. And it, there's a P1. So curves that look like this are parameterized by P1. Now that's a little confusing, because how do I have a P1 here, since the normalization is completely determined? Well, as we discussed yesterday, there's this extra C star of moduli for a tac nodal curve, because I have to specify an isomorphism between the tangent spaces. OK, well, that's C star. Where did I get P1? Well, the point is at 0 and infinity, you know, I'm sprouting off one extra semi-stable component to compactify that moduli space. So it turns out that there really is this P1 of tac nodal curves here. That accounts for the fact that you get a flip. In other words, which, kind, which tac node you get depends on how you approach a given elliptic bridge. So that sort of says that this is only going to be a rational map, not a contraction. Now the interesting feature here is, why didn't I have a flip going from here to here? So that's a little weird, right? And the point here is that there's something very beautiful that happens which is that if I look at tac nodal curves like this, there isn't a C star of datum, there isn't a C star data to determine the isomorphism class because any two such choices can be made equivalent by an automorphism of the normalization. What happens here is that the C star automorphisms on this component of the normalization basically cancel out that attaching moduli. So in fact, the isomorphism class of a tac nodal curve here is uniquely determined, which says that you get a regular map here instead of this, this flip. So what's going on here is something that you know, is very nice from the perspective of Mori theory, which is that whenever we see a divisorial component that we need to get rid of, it always turns out we just get a straight divisorial contraction, as we would like. But whenever we see a higher co-dimension component, this phenomenon of moduli of attaching data always allows us to flip. The sort of flip is built into the moduli functor. OK? So let me just finish off this example. So we just have to go from M14 of 2 to M14 of 3. <clears throat> so inside here, the only kind of elliptic three bridges that we have are curves that look like this. So I have genus 1 and genus 0. So this here is an elliptic three bridge by my definition. And this is one of those cases where you just get a straight divisorial contraction where each of these P1s is sort of, you sprout a P1 at those marked points. So we're going to get 
when the curve is like this. And again, there's sort of the automorphisms of the normalization here completely cancel the attaching data um, of a planar triple point so that you just get a straight regular map here. Okay? So there's this very uh, explicit sequence of birational transformations. Now M14 bar, its Picard group is generated by all its boundary divisors. And if you look at what we've done here, we've basically contracted every boundary divisor except delta irreducible. So this is actually a very nice space. I mean, this is a Fano variety with um, Q factorial singularities and Picard number one. I mean, this is, so M1N for a small n is not, you know, of general type, so we're not going to get a canonical model. But this is certainly, uh, in some sense, the end product of the minimal model program applied to this thing. Okay, so how can we kind of put all this into a, a general theorem? <coughs> Let's see, how are we doing for time? Uh, what, what, what am I going to? I'm going to... Uh, so 20 minutes, okay. Um, <laughs> God, sometimes it just flies, you know? Um, so, let's see. <laughs> yeah, how did Dawei get away with those extra 10 minutes? So, so <laughs> Okay, so I mean, I, I just kind of want to draw one more... Let me just draw one more picture and then, uh, then I'll state the theorem. So in general, the point is that everything that I've drawn here kind of carries over completely to completely describe this transformation. So, but it's a very beautiful picture. So if you look at kind of elliptic M bridges, so, the, so here I have in mind some partition of my marked points into M distinct subsets which are lying on these genus zero components and this is an elliptic bridge so the locus of curves that look like this is basically m1 m bar for the bridge times m0 s1 plus an attaching point for this component times dot 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 times so the locus of curves that look like this uh, is parameterized by a variety like this the point is this is flipped to the locus of elliptic m-fold pointed curves whose normalization is the same p1s. And now what is this variety parameterized by? Well the point is it's best to kind of think of this as a small contraction and then you flip, right? So the point is the small contraction is going to just completely lose the data of this M1NM. So in some kind of small contraction that sits below these two spaces, um, you just have this. And then the point is that this, these things are parameterized by a completely explicit projective bundle over this product of moduli spaces. So psi i here is the cotangent bundle along the attaching section of the corresponding moduli space down here. So the point is, look, if I want to parameterize a curve like this, first I pick the normalization. That's a point inside this product. And then it turns out that in general, to define the sort of how you glue for an elliptic m-fold point, you basically have to pick a co-dimension one subspace inside the direct sum of the um, cotangent spaces at each of the branches. So that's exactly parameterized by an explicit projective bundle here. So the point is that we have a very explicit description of what these kind of boundary strata look like inside this moduli space. And that's going to be a key point for, for the theorem that I write down in a second. OK? So we have this sort of explicit factorization. OK, so what we'd like to do now is sort of use these spaces to run something like the, the hassett keel program for M1N bar. Okay, and the only curveball that I have to throw at you, and if I have time, I can justify this at the end, but uh, <laughs> if you guys are fading, we can, we can save that for another day. Um, so what I'm going to do is instead of looking at the divisor KM1N bar plus alpha delta, I'm just going to look at plus alpha delta irreducible, and I'm just going to keep the coefficient of delta reducible at 1. So of course, what I have in mind here is that delta irreducible is just closure of the locus of curves that look like this. And delta reducible is just 
all the rest of the boundary components. In other words, closure of all curves that look like that. Okay, so the point is instead of um, scaling down all of delta, I'm just going to scale down delta irreducible. There are uh, very important reasons why that is kind of the correct analog of the HACCP program for uh, pointed curves rather than scaling down all of delta. And as I say, if somebody asks me about that at the end, I can explain it. Okay, but let's just take this as our as a sort of the divisor, the sort of ray of the divisors that we want to use. And then, okay, so let's define R of alpha to be the associated graded ring. Uh, okay, then here's the theorem. Okay, so the theorem, and here I will have to use my notes. Okay, so the theorem is, I mean, first of all, so when is this divisor class big? So in other words, I mean, when does this ring actually have a lot of sections? So it turns out that this is big if and only if it depends on n. This is a reflection of the fact that the Kadir dimension of m1 n bar changes at n equals 11. So don't worry too much about this. The point is I'm, this, this number gets negative, which is fine. I'm just telling you that, OK, so this divisor is big for a certain range of alpha. And then the cool thing is that for all alpha in this range, we, we're going to prove that it's finitely generated. Now the point is, when alpha is positive, of course, this, this follows basically by the standard results of BCHM, but our proof will be completely independent of that. And in fact, we're going to get this for uh, even some negative values of alpha too. Okay, and furthermore, um, if I, all right, now there's a kind of clashing notation. I apologize about this, but if I try to do anything about it at this stage, it will be a disaster. So let me just say that, so, the a corresponding projective model that I get by taking proj of these graded rings is the associated um, moduli space of m-stable curves if alpha is in the interval okay so of course it's sort of hard to parse all these numerics so let me just draw a picture so as I scale alpha what this is saying is that up to 10 twelfths, this divisor D of alpha is just ample on M1 N bar. And then I just have a very regular progression. Between 10 twelfths and 9 twelfths, the corresponding model is just M1 N of 1. In other words, the model with cusps. Um, between 9 twelfths and 8 twelfths, it's just M1 N of 2. <clears throat> and this goes on until you get... Um, between 10 minus n over 12 and 11 minus n over 12, this is just uh, m1n of n minus 1. Okay, so the point is that with this, within this one-dimensional slice of the effective cone of m1n bar, we have a complete Mori chamber decomposition corresponding to these alternate moduli spaces. So in other words, if you're just willing to buy my contention for the moment that this was the ray that I want to look at instead of k plus alpha delta, then in fact we've done everything. I mean, I'm giving you exactly the critical values, and I'm telling you exactly how the moduli spaces change when you cross the um, the threshold values. Yeah. So, I am. Um, how positive is it? Um, so, I mean, if you're asking where these. Oh, right. So is M1 N bar, so right. So at this point, we should ask, is M1 N bar a Mori dream space? Yeah, but still, I mean, this seems like evidence in that direction, right? I mean, because here's at least a particular one parameter slice. But I'm saying for given all these spaces, we already don't know whether it is Mori dream, but still sometimes we know we are okay right now. Yeah, I didn't think about it. So I'll have to talk to you after the talk about that. I'm not quite sure. 
OK. So let me explain how you prove this theorem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about the singularities of these spaces? Right, so that's another big issue. How singular are these spaces? Um, I'll address that in a second. Um, let me just make one, OK, so there is one little white lie here, which is that the really key thing is that we want these spaces to be normal. If they're normal, then everything that I'm saying is sort of going through no problem, as, as you'll see in the proof in a second. The problem is that actually it's not immediately obvious from what I've said so far that they're even normal. I mean, we, nobody really seems to know that much about the deformation space of an elliptic m-fold point. That could be very singular. So that is one um, hidden fly in the ointment. But let me just gloss over that for now. Other than that, I, I can tell you some quite precise things about the singularities. They do become singular. So for example, it turns out that they're smooth up to m equals 5, which is you know, not something that you would see right away. You need some kind of serious deformation theory machinery. But let me just um, sketch the proof of this theorem, and then we can talk about that after. So how do you prove something like this? So the idea is that you look at this explicit birational map. from m1n bar to m1n of m. And then, of course, you look at your divisor d of alpha, and then you want to do two things. So the first part is a discrepancy calculation. And that's actually, from my perspective, that's the easy part. So I think this was the hard part for the earlier talk. right? So you just want to see, this just says that the section ring doesn't change if you compare d of alpha to the push forward of d of alpha on m1n of m. And the point is, so how do you prove this? Well, it's very easy. You basically. You take this divisor, this whole divisor, and you can explicitly write it out as a linear combination of boundary divisors on M1n because the boundary divisors generate the Picard group of M1n. And then you just, so you explicitly write this out as a combination of uh, boundary divisors with un indetermined coefficients, and then you just intersect with a bunch of test curves to determine the coefficients. And so this kind of thing is just an easy intersection theory calculation on M1n. And of course, this is for alpha in the stated interval. So that's the discrepancy calculation. And then really the much more interesting thing is to say that if I push this divisor down so that now I'm looking at this divisor on this space, I need to show that this divisor is ample. OK? I mean, if I can do those two things, then I'm done. All right. Because then that says that the section ring that I was interested in uh, is equal to the section ring of this push down divisor. But if that's ample, then of course proj of it is, is just this space. OK? So the thing is, how are you going to prove? So the reason GIT comes into this so often is that you know, GIT is really your sort of your tool for getting ample divisors on spaces. But the point is, we're in such an explicit case here. We have M1N. I mean, we can basically write that space down. Furthermore, I explicitly describe the boundary strata. What we're going to do is just use Kleinman's criterion. We can just explicitly write this divisor out as, so what it ends up being is this. I mean, if you don't know what these things are, don't worry about it. But So this is the way I like to think of it. So this is just some combination of delta irreducible plus psi minus delta reducible. And the point is, these are all divisors, and we can compute their intersection numbers on curves quite effectively. So what I'm going to do is just show that this divisor has positive intersection on every curve inside my space for alpha in the stated interval. OK, so for appropriate alpha. And I mean, and it's actually this kind of very simple intersection theory calculation that really, in some sense, explains where these threshold numbers come from. So I think if I just write down one example, you guys will see the, um, the idea. <clears throat> so if we looked at this, um, so we had this flip, right? And so a typical curve in this space, so let's think of this. So th this was a flip. So there's a small contraction between. And a curve that's getting contracted by this arrow, you could basically write down that curve explicitly as follows. If I just take a pencil of elliptic curves, so here's a pencil of elliptic curves. And you take two sections, two disjoint sections on that. And then just attach 
uh, a constant family of genus zero curves with two marked points to each side, right? The point is this is a curve on that space in which I'm varying the J invariant of the elliptic bridge. So this is gets contracted as I go to this small contraction. On the other hand, what does a typical fiber of this map look like? Well, that's exactly this curve where I have a tack nodal curve. And now I vary the C star moduli of attaching data. So that gives me a curve over C star. And then at 0 and infinity, I have this picture. So this is a typical fiber here. So let me just compute intersection numbers of every divisor class on these, um, on these curves. OK, so delta irreducible. So maybe I'll call this curve B1, and I'll call this curve B2. OK, so delta irreducible dot B1, well, that's just the number of nodes in a um, pencil of cubics. That's 12. Psi is 0. Psi is not going to come into this calculation at all. Um, so psi is 0 because these sections aren't moving. If you don't know the definition of psi, don't worry about it. Just trust me, that's 0. On the other hand, delta irreducible dot B1, since I have these reducible nodes along these sections, and each of these is a minus 1 section, these are just the sections that you get in the standard way as exceptional divisors when you blow up the base points of a pencil. Um, so because I have two minus one sections here, delta reducible dot B1 is minus two. Okay, so those intersection numbers are a completely standard calculation. Now let's go over here and ask, what is delta irreducible dot B1? What is, or sorry, B2? What is psi dot B2? And what is delta reducible dot B2? Okay, well, psi is again zero because the sections aren't changing. This was basically just a family constructed with constant normalization. Now, delta reducible, you see that I sprout a reducible node at two distinct points on this curve. So delta reducible is obviously two. Okay, but now the whole point that I want to make here is how do we compute delta irreducible on this curve? All of a sudden, we're in a domain where the normal heuristics that we always you know, are used to for intersection theory on mg bar don't really help here. You've got to remember that this is a family contained entirely inside delta irreducible. And now the geometry of delta irreducible is basically the geometry of the discriminant inside the versal deformation space of a TAC node. So it's really ugly. So we have this whole new kind of intersection theory problem to deal with. So the way I get around this is in a very ad hoc way, which is that the following. I mean, it's really cool. So I mean, what I'm saying is that that problem that I just posed, I think, is still a problem that somebody should take up and think about. The way we're going to get around this is as follows. On M1 n bar, we have a relation. 12 lambda is equal to delta irreducible. Now, do we have lambda on this space, on these spaces M1, N of M? Well, sure. I mean, we can do exactly the same thing. We have a Hodge bundle. The, exactly the same relation has to hold because the entire space is isomorphic to M1 n bar outside of codimension 2. So basically, you still have the relation 12 lambda equals delta irreducible. So all I really have to do is compute the degree of lambda on this family. But that's a very explicit calculation. I mean, to write down the Hodge bundle, I mean, we have an explicit description of the dualizing sheaf on a family of singular curves, da 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 da. You do some exact sequences. Turns out that the degree of lambda on this thing is minus 1. Therefore, the degree of delta irreducible is minus 12. So what you see is that these intersection numbers exactly flip. Right? I mean, they're exactly negative of each other. So if you sort of plug that into these numbers with this divisor here, what you find that this calculation tells you is exactly that, um, I mean, that D of alpha is positive on B1 if and only if alpha is greater than 9 twelfths, and D of alpha is positive on B2 if and only if alpha is less than 9 twelfths. So the point that I'm trying to make is that you can just see at a very explicit level of doing the intersection theory of how the positivity of this divisor class D of alpha changes as you move from one moduli space to the next. Now there's still a much bigger argument you have to make here, right? I mean, you can sort of see that, okay, well obviously these should be the extremal things here. But you really have to make an argument to check every curve. But I mean, you can do that. You just sort of go case by case. You say, well, if the general fiber is nodal, then you know, these divisors are positive, and yeah. But then, at m if the kind of the curve is not smooth Is not? Uh, I, I mean, here you, in this equation, your curve is a P1 or something. But yeah. But what, what happens if, I don't know, the curve is a P1 or something? 
you mean a curve inside the moduli space? That's not actually a problem. You can always assume the curve is smooth just by looking at its normalization. And so you can always have a family over a smooth base. In other words, if you can just compute the degree of your line bundle on any family of m-stable curves over a smooth base, that's enough. Because, yeah. Okay, so, so this is how you get um, that sort of result. Um, and so now the, the last thing that I just want to mention here, just in one minute, uh, <laughs> is that, I mean, I just want to say why was that divisor class the right divisor class to use? The point is that we can actually use all this technology to do something basically exactly um, like what we saw in an earlier talk to sort of actually compute threshold values for the minimal model program on mg bar. So what if we do the following thing? We can think of m1n bar as a subvariety of mg bar by taking these m marked points and just gluing, actually it doesn't matter how you glue them, just glue on some fixed high genus curves at the marked points in such a way that you put this as a subvariety inside of mg bar. Then of course what we should do is pull back the divisors we really care about. And it turns out that that is uh, numerically proportional, if you work it out, to this divisor for a certain change of variables. So you need here that uh, alpha is equal to minus 11 plus 24 beta over 1 plus 12 beta. OK. So the point is that run, if you're running this sort of log minimal model program on mg bar and you want to see what it does to m1n bar, you really want to look at these divisors on m1n bar and see what happens. And so the point is that um, if I look at my numbers, beta equals 10 twelfths, 9 twelfths, these are the threshold values I get on m1n. OK, if I go into this formula, what do I get for alpha? Well, of course, I get 9 elevenths. That's the stage at which cusps should occur. So we've already seen that value come up. Next, we get 7 tenths. That's TAC nodes. The next thing I get is 5 ninths. So what my calculation is suggesting, again, this is sort of not so rigorous, but in some sense, it says that at 5 ninths, planar triple points should occur. Then the next less than or equal to 5 are exactly the ones that have a smooth deformation space. But that's uh, a different topic. OK, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Okay.